Blog Talk Radio. The Purple Angel. This is Lori LeBay, the host of Alzheimer's Speaks Radio, and uh, welcome to the show today. We're going to have a really interesting uh, conversation about FTD or frontal temporal uh, dementia, and it's such a, a needed topic um, to discuss, and so I invite all of you to join the conversation. Before we get started, we always have new listeners, so I just want to give you a little background about Alzheimer's Speaks um, and uh, who we are and what we're about. Um, Bottom line, we're an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. We truly believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those living with the disease live with purpose. They deserve that. We all deserve that. Um, together um, through these conversations, I, I really believe that we're we're also going to be able to understand the true needs, what it's really like, and how each of us can help. Uh, we can um, help remove the fears and the isolation uh, that so much encumbrances um, dementia. At our core, uh, we believe that collaboratively we're going to beat this battle against dementia. And I know that it's working because of all your likes and all your clicks and all your shares with Facebook and LinkedIn and your Google circles and your email friends. Um, We were honored here at Alzheimer's Speaks to be the number one influencer online regarding Alzheimer's, according to ShareCare, which is the largest health and wellness organization um, online, and Dr. Oz. And again, we didn't do that alone. We did that because you're out there helping promote information putting it out to your your circles, your tribes, because, you know, so many times we don't know what somebody's life is really like. People are embarrassed to talk about this. So the more information we can have readily available for people, the easier it's going to be uh, for them to grab it when they need it. Um, So again, I thank you. While you're listening today, if you wouldn't mind um, clicking on the show, saying that you like it and wanting to share it, I would greatly appreciate that. And um, if you're kind of a social media whiz while you're listening, feel free to push it out onto your different platforms as well. Um, I always like to give a little shout out to, before we get started, to some organizations that a lot of people just don't know where to go when they're looking for help when it comes to dealing with dementia and caregiving. So Alzheimer's Disease International is the organization of all the Alzheimer's associations around the world. There um, you'll be able to get hooked up to uh, who's closest to you. You're also going to get some great research and some global insights as as to what's going on. Um, Health Star Home Health is uh, located here in Minnesota, an amazing home health company that really gets dementia. Uh, they have been trained as Alzheimer's whispers, and not only are their staff trained, but their staff are trained to help families um, deal with these situations in terms of how to engage and, and how to live life well. If you're looking for a more holistic approach, check out the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. There you'll find great information on not only diet and exercise, but meditation, 
they also have some free educational platforms uh, that I, I think you'll find useful. The Lewy Body Dementia Association and uh, the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, which we are lucky to have with us today, um, are both specific types of dementia. And you know, when you're dealing with a specific type, it's nice to get to the to the people who really know. So um, check uh, check both of those out. Also, many times with dementia, people will have trouble with speech and so the National Aphasia Association can just be a wonderful wonderful resource for you as well um, some of you may not know but there is a new organization that's cropped up called Dementia Action Alliance or DAANow.org uh, which is um, new here in the U.S., and they are just kind of getting off the ground, but I would encourage you to check that out, daanow.org. Uh, they are really trying to help pull policy and um, and collaborations together here in the United States. On the fun side, I'm a big believer in music. Uh, it can help us connect. So Alzheimer's Music Connect is a fantastic place to go. They actually have a, a, pending, a, a patent pending uh, regarding their technology, which helps people engage for up to three hours after they listen to the music. And the music is just gorgeous and normal. You wouldn't think that there is anything different with it. Uh, Sometimes people are looking for things to do, and Puzzle With Me can be a great resource there created by um, a woman who was touched by dementia, and she has um, beautiful age-appropriate pictures, um, fewer pieces, but yet bigger pieces for adults. Um, and then Jiminy Wicket, which is an adaptive croquet game, which can be used not only um, for uh, people with dementia, but they also hook up um, schools and organizations with memory uh, communities to play one-on-one. -on -one. And so it's just a great way uh, to, to get educated and have fun at the same time. So I am done with all our little housekeeping things other than to tell you we really want you to join this conversation today. And so I will be monitoring our chat box, which is just at the bottom of the page if you're listening via the Internet. Um, or you can call in live, and I'll be pulling in callers as we go here um, with questions. If you have a question, you just have to push one, and then I'll, I'll know that you um, aren't just listening because some people do just listen by calling in on the phone line there. Um, our first guest, we're going to kick off uh, this show with, with going to the source. Um, and the source, in this case, is the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, known as AF. TD. And we're going to be speaking with Sharon Denny, who is their program director, where she leads their support and education efforts uh, for people who are dealing with FTD, um, along with their families and healthcare professionals, you know, because this involves everybody. Her priorities there at the association include ensuring that they are um, that they have a responsive core of services, such as their helpline and um, Comstock Respite and the Travel Grant Program, which I, I'm sure she'll be talking about. Sharon um, has just done a lot with creative initiatives um, to also address the needs of children and teens um, and individuals diagnosed with FTD. Again, this touches everybody. And for the past four years, she has led the committee of uh, clinicians and family caregivers who produced Partners in FTD Care, an FTD education um, initiative for community health care providers. Uh, Sharon Karen has actually been with the association since 2008. And so welcome to the show, Sharon. How are you today? Thanks so much, Lori. It's really great to be back with you. You know, you've been a real champion for people with FTD and for our organization. So we really appreciate this opportunity to join you again. 
Well, I wanted to have you kind of kick us off. This whole show kind of came off um, because um, Prelude um, had contacted me, Prelude Memory Care, and said, hey, you know, I really think that this is a need. And I'm like, you know, it's been a while since we've talked about this, and, and Prelude will be with us a little bit later in the show. But I wanted you to tell us, um, you know, what exactly um, – is the mission of your organization, and maybe give people a little background on on what exactly is frontal temporal lobe dementia. Sure, thank you. So AFTD um, was founded in 2002, and we were founded by a group of caregivers who um, had been dealing with FTD in a loved one and knew just how hard it was to find appropriate services and support. And so they banded together to start an organization in order to bring more attention to these diseases. And so we've been growing since that time, and we're really excited to recognize at this point in our organizational growth the impact that we've been able to have um, as kind of a hub for this community. So you had mentioned earlier that we do bring together both the folks who are diagnosed, their family members, and researchers and clinicians working in the field. And it's a great privilege, actually, to be in that position Um, The collaboration that you mentioned earlier in the field of dementia, we know how important that is, and so it's great to be part of that. Our mission spans everything from research to the support and education that you mentioned. So our goal is to improve the quality of life for people affected by FTD currently and to drive research to a cure. Obviously, they go both hand in hand, and both are equally critical to the um, community that we serve. So every day we really work towards that mission through promoting and funding research, um, specifically honing in on those projects that will advance our understanding of FTD and move towards treatments and cures in these diseases. We do work very hard to raise awareness because everything starts with awareness. Uh, FTD is a rare disease, and so the more people who know about it, the more people will be able to uh, find correct, accurate diagnoses and get the services that they need. We do provide a core group of services, and I can talk about that more in terms of what they are, but support to the people who are impacted by these diseases is one of the critical things that AFTD was founded to do. We do provide education to health professionals. Again, everything works together, and so the more uh, community professionals and physicians who understand the needs of people with FTD, the better we'll be in delivering the services that people need and advocacy So obviously from a public policy issue, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in all the dementias and certainly in the ones that are less well-known. Agree, agree. Lots and lots of work there. Can you tell us maybe some of the symptoms that people have um, with, with FTD? Sure. So folks do know and appreciate that FTD is a neurodegenerative disease. So it is one of the dementias. But there are three things that really make FTD different from Alzheimer's and the more common dementias. One is that it's rare, as I mentioned. The other is that it it really does start with different symptoms. So we tend to think of dementia as being associated with memory and memory loss, memory impairment. FTD is a cluster of disorders that affect different parts of our brain and therefore different functions. So much more commonly, people with FTD see changes early on in their behavior and in their personality, or they see changes in language and communication, or also in areas of movement. And so rather than memory, we're really talking about symptoms that are um, more subtle in many ways. They're not traditionally associated with dementia or neurodegenerative disease. And they overlap with a lot of other things, which makes diagnosis really difficult. So um, there's three presentations, the behavioral presentation, language and communication, and movement. And of those three, the most common and probably the one that people think of as most um, naturally associated with FTD is the behavioral type. And so this Mm -hmm. is also called frontotemporal dementia. We use frontotemporal degeneration for the whole cluster of different subtypes that fall under this category. Um, But frontotemporal dementia or or behavioral FTD um, is probably the one that's most commonly associated with this group of disorders. 
sure. And can people get all types of symptoms with that, or is it just you, you know someone has problems with movement, or someone has problems with language, or or behavior, personality, or do they overlap as well? Usually, what happens is that the earliest symptoms start in one part of the brain. And so you have symptoms that are, you know, you see changes in one area of functioning. So, for mm-hmm. example, if someone uh, someone might have subtle and early changes to their behavior, you know, someone who has been a very well-accomplished um, business executive, well-respected, people around them may start to recognize that something just doesn't seem the same, that they are forgetting appointments, they don't seem to be paying the same attention to the kinds of uh, fastidious preparation, Uh, meetings aren't organized as well, and then you may see things like people uh, will have some, uh, they start to sort of uh, interact differently with others, you know, they're uh, language becomes more casual. Somebody who has always been pretty formal might be interacting with coworkers in a much more casual way or start to say inappropriate things or off-color jokes. Um, so changes in behavior can be very uh, subtle early on, but you tend to see one area of functioning affected first. Similarly, people with a language presentation will start with early changes to language. So you may have people who have difficulty finding the words that they want or they have difficulty producing speech that becomes more hesitant or they're stuttering. Um, And the same would be in the movement domain. People may start to develop changes in their physical movements. They may become more slow. Um, They may have more rigid muscles and difficulty with balance. And so what we know is over time, it's those early symptoms that may uh, hopefully get people to see a doctor and get them towards a a, a diagnosis. Um, As the disease progresses, all this whole cluster is neurodegenerative. As the disease progresses, uh, additional parts of the brain and additional brain circuitry becomes affected by disease, and so the symptoms will change as well. So what often happens over time is that uh, with progression, you start to see symptoms showing up in other areas of functioning. So it's very, very common that somebody who maybe starts with these changes in their behavior and personality will develop difficulties with language over time. Similarly, okay. people who start with difficulties in language will develop dif- some uh, changes in behavior over time. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's that's definitely helpful. Um, it's so hard because there's so many different types of dementia to kind of know um, what symptoms go with which one. And, um, I, you know, I, I hear from people all the time the, the misdiagnosis um, and the misunderstanding when people go to, you know, their physicians for help. Is that something fairly common with, with FTD? It's tremendously common, and it's a huge, huge challenge for the field. You know, the symptoms do overlap with a lot of psychiatric disorders, or they may overlap with other types of neurological disorders. Sometimes they're very subtle, and people, you know, FTD generally is a disease that um, is first noticed by those people who are most close to the patient um, because you notice subtle but important changes in those relationships. And it's very often those changes in the relationship or the closeness of those relationships that people feel first without even really necessarily knowing that this is a health issue. A lot of times people are referred to psychiatrists or there's a, uh, you know, an effort to, to try to identify is this a, a stress that we're responding to? Is there something happening at work or happening in the family that's causing it? So, uh, being able to move towards better ways of diagnosing these disorders earlier is really critical. One of the um, statistics that we've seen that we use is that the average time from the start of symptoms to an accurate diagnosis in Alzheimer's is about two and a half years. In FTD, that becomes about three and a half years. And so if somebody starts to experience these really important changes early on, but it takes another three and a half years before they find out that this is a neurodegenerative disease that's causing these changes, it can be really devastating due to the nature of the symptoms and the changes in relationships. Um, So shrinking that time and helping people to get diagnosed accurately and sooner is a really important part of the research happening in the field. Wow, I just I can't imagine the frustration that people go through 
um, but not knowing, um, knowing something's wrong, but um, not finding the help easily. That That's just got to be um, I, I just almost unbearable for them, I would think, at times, and for their families as well. Um, when you know something is off, and and I would imagine it can't be easy for the physicians either, you know, when they're when they're going in for their appointments. Um, can you tell us in in what ways, you know, general dementia services how they really don't meet the needs of those with um, FTD? That's a really good question, and it's part of. Uh truly part of the experience of living with FTD that we hear from all sectors of the community that, you know, their general dementia services do many things very well. You know, there is certainly a move towards more person-centered care, trying to drive goals from what an individual needs. Um, We know that uh, folks with dementia of any sort are very sensitive to the external environment, so approaches and interventions that will try to help um, people reduce the stimulation in the in the environment are very helpful. Um, the from a professional standpoint or a caregiver standpoint, having a general per, interpersonal approach that kind of calms things down is very valuable. These are all really critical places to start, but. When it comes to FTD, they don't go far enough. And so what we find is that there are a lot of ways that those services, um, especially when the symptoms and the um, kind of what's happening in the brain and the parts of the brain that are affected, if that's not well understood, then sometimes the misunderstandings, even within dementia care services, is really critical for our population. Um, So, again, you know, we're talking about three things that are really different here about FTD from Alzheimer's. It's rare. So this cluster of symptoms is not well identified. People don't look at somebody with FTD who um, and say they recognize that this is dementia. You know, so we're talking about a younger population. The average age of onset for FTD is in the mid-50s. Again, it's quite a, dis- a difference. There is a small portion of Alzheimer's that's young onset, but the vast majority of FTD is young onset. So, in fact, about 60% of all, uh, I'm sorry, the the most common form of dementia that's diagnosed in people under 60 is FTD. And so, from a young onset standpoint, most of our population is diagnosed when they're really at the prime of their lives, when they're at the height of their careers or very involved in their family lives. And this complicates things. It's not what we usually expect in terms of dementia services. So there's a mis- a mismatch there. Um, what, we what also you, know that... Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, so well, what are you doing to to meet those needs? What do you, what's, well, what part is your of what, organization... So we're trying to do a couple of things. We really try to address the unique symptoms of FTD throughout the services sector, both in terms of our own services and then working as a catalyst for others to learn more about these diseases. Um, You know, the services that we provide really are tailored specifically for the younger population, for the cluster of symptoms that go along with FTD in terms of the um, understanding the, the impact of the behavior changes and language changes on a family, on a young family, and trying to make sure the resources are there. Um, you mentioned the kids and teens. You know, we have had a significant effort to really understand what the y- impact on young families is. Um, and so we've we've tailored some publications to those needs. We've created a website for children of folks with FTD so that they have some avenues to try to understand, um, you know, the the disease, what they see happening and the changes in their family. So the key for us really is to try to continue to pull together all the different portions of our community as the experts, distill that information, and then provide back uh, resources that are more specific to those needs. Okay. Well, that that makes a lot a lot of sense. I would imagine um, just using a younger population and stuff too. You might be looking at different types of of 
technology or or platforms in terms of way to serve just because of um, skill sets and interest levels and all of those types of things. Is that true as well or? We are to some extent, so we do have the, the website for kids and teens. It's aftdkidsandteens.org. We also have uh, started a secret, so an invisible Facebook group for young adults. You know, we mm-hmm. know that because it's a younger onset, FTD affects the whole family system in ways that traditional, you know, uh, older dementias do not. And so you have, uh, many people do have young kids at home or teens at home when a person is diagnosed. We also know that there's a lot of people where there are young adults in the family just on the cusp of emancipation who are trying to uh, move through a push-me-pull-you of wanting to be there to help to take care of a parent who's ill, but also wanting to be able to take those early steps in their own lives. The Facebook group is a place where those young adults who are caring for a parent can kind of come together and share information and experiences, um, knowing that they're their privacy is protected as much as it can be, um, but that they can connect with peers. You know, the impact. I was just going to say that. So we are using different platforms. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think those those Facebook Facebook platforms are so powerful in terms of connecting and giving privacy, um, yet connecting um, people and and removing some of that isolation and helping with the understanding and support. So I I, I think that that's wonderful that you're that that you're so <clears throat> understanding of all the different variables that that are taking place um, with someone who's who's dealing with this and their family members and their friends as well. Uh, it, it's just, you know, none of, when I look at dementia, none of us are in this alone. And I think it's so critical for for us as individuals and um, and organizations as well to, to really keep that in mind. Um, and so I, I give you kudos for, for really getting that because I don't think everybody does um, understand the importance of that. Well, one of the advantages that we have is that we we have um, we learn from every sector of our community, and we're able to pull all those different pieces together and try to figure out what's the best way to respond. Um, you know, one of the one of the things again about FTD that's quite different that really impacts both the services that are needed and how education has to happen is one of the characteristics of the behavioral changes, which is. You know, it, FTD affects the social brain. It affects our, our our relationships, our interpersonal skills. And one of the things that's very often lost in FTD is a sense of empathy. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that that loss of empathy has tremendous ripple effects. Uh, you can imagine that if you've been married to someone for 30 years and you've spent your adult lives together, created a family, have worked through lots of um, career challenges and whatnot, and you gradually see that person disconnecting from the relationship. And you, we, we were talking earlier about the, you know, the time to diagnosis. This period of time where this starts to change, where you feel a loved one disconnecting and it's not identified as a disease, is terribly destructive. And that's where there's a lot of potential for hurt and confusion on the part of uh, couples and families. When you know that it's a symptom of disease, and we've identified that that loss of empathy is one of the impacts of behavioral FTD, you know, disease in the frontal part of the brain, then understanding what that means and how that's carried through is really important um, because you know, caregivers will be reminded, oh, I know it's the disease, I know it's not the person, I know that FTD causes this loss of empathy. But you'll see it played out in so many ways, whether it's, you know, a parent saying to their kid, uh, you know, I don't I don't want to go look for the prom dress with you, I'm, I'd just rather stay here and watch TV. Um, or, you know, a, 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 in other cases, you know, you have somebody who really has – is losing that ability to tune into the other people around them. Well, we know that it creates great emotional toll on the caregiver, lots of um, difficulties in terms of stress and strain and hurt and anger, 
but here you are, you're caring for this person. You know in your head that this is an impact from the disease, and yet figuring out how do you carry through interventions every day that are going to make it possible to, to have the best quality of life for your loved one, for yourself and your family if you have kids at home. It's a really different sort of a uh, challenge, um, especially when care providers are not familiar with this aspect of the impact. You know, the interventions can be tailored to help people understand why this loss of empathy is so important in FTD in particular over and above other types of dementia and how then interventions can be created and supports can be created to help everyone have the best approach to managing those symptoms as possible. Okay, wonderful. Well, can you give us um, a a couple of um, programs, just highlight them quickly, because I want to get on to Howard Glick, who um, is living with uh, FTD, and also pull in uh, one of our caregivers here as well. But um, if you want to just toss out a couple of um, programs, highlight them quickly, and um, give out websites or something, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So everybody should know that our our core services really revolve around, um, especially on the support side, around uh, a helpline. You know, there's a lot of information on our website. We do have a helpline. People can either email us at info at org, or can call us toll-free, and that number is 866-507-7222. The website and the helpline are often the front door for people and how they find us and our services. And we do individual responses. We try to get back to people within two business days. So we're not a a hotline per se, but we respond to all those calls individually. Um, AFTD runs some telephone support groups directly for caregivers. We do also run a telephone support group for people who are diagnosed with FTD. We do offer respite grants. You mentioned in the introduction the Comstock Caregiver Respite Program. We offer small um, amounts of financial assistance to full-time in-home caregivers uh, as a way of encouraging them to use respite and continue to support themselves. We also do education conferences, and we have a conference coming up in April in San Diego that I encourage people to look into and come and join us for. Um, On the education side, one of our most important and valuable initiatives is called Partners in FTD Care, and it is an effort to provide case-based studies and newsletters for community professionals who are working with folks affected by FTD. We have a great um, collaborative committee that brings in experts from nursing, nurse education, caregivers, um, social work, folks with really lots of years experience in dementia and FTD, and we put together case-based studies that can be used uh, for in-service trainings or for uh, support within facilities or home health care. Um, and we, we do a tremendous amount on the side of awareness. So I would encourage people to look for National FTD Awareness Week every year, the first week of October. This is really helping us to raise the profile of attention given to these disorders. And it's a nice vehicle for folks at the grassroots level and the communities to get involved in productive ways. Wonderful. Now, the best uh, the the best uh, way to get you is through the website, I would imagine, which is um, www.theaftd.org. Um, and then you had also mentioned the um, Teens and Kids site, which is AFTD Kids and Teens, uh, both plural. dot org. Uh, you also have a Helpline, which is 866-507-7222. Well, I I thank you so much for being with us, uh, Sharon, and feel free to hang on the line here with us if you'd like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull Howard in, but I'll be muting you at this point. And... um, but uh, you know, if you can hang with us, there there may be some callers that have questions a little bit later on in the show. Okay. Thanks very much, Lori. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to um, pull in someone actually diagnosed with this disease. And Howard Glick um, has been diagnosed with FTD since um, 2010. And following six and a half years of being diagnosed and treated for 
bipolar disorder, you know, he finally got uh, this FTD diagnosis. Um, I, I can't imagine the, the type of adjustment um, that he went through um, in terms of struggling to try to figure out what's actually going on with his body. But and I, hopefully he'll he'll tell us a little bit about that. Now he really devotes all of his energy to raising awareness and helping others with this diagnosis. He writes a blog about his experience, and he's exceeded over 171,000 visits from people. He moderates a Facebook uh, group for people with FTD um, that is growing. And in September of 2011, he has now been working on a Think Film um, with or a film, I should say, with Think Film Inc. called Howard's Brain, that will help the public understand this disease from a patient's point of view. And right now, they have over 300 hours um, of filming, so it's going to be a lot of editing going on there to to pick uh, pick out those those wonderful pieces. Uh, Howard lives in uh, in Arizona. He was once a, a very successful businessman. He is a divorced father of two, and um, he manages his own care. So not everybody, a lot of times we always assume there's somebody, uh, you know, there's a partner that's taking care of us. And so I, I'm really excited to have Howard with us today on the show. How are you doing today, Howard? Yeah, hi, Lori. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Well, I'm excited Hello? to have you here. Oh. I yeah, I'm really excited to have you here and with us. Um, I, you know, we just have a, a short period of time. I could talk uh, on this topic all day long. But uh, how frustrating was it for you to to be misdiagnosed, um, you know, prior to getting your, your formal diagnosis of, of FTD? Uh, you, you lose everything, Um I was misdiagnosed, I think, for about five, six years. I was a successful businessman with an 18-year career, and all of a sudden I didn't know what was happening. My loved ones didn't know what was happening. Uh, they first thought I was it was from depression. I My behavior was off. I couldn't find my way home. I was also getting divorced, so they said maybe it was from that. All of a sudden, within six months, I started going on pills. I, they put me on up to 17 pills a day at one point, the harshest medications, and nothing was working. I had electric shocks, uh, about 100 electric shocks, which most people in the normal lifetime had 20, 25 of that. Uh, then they put an implant in my chest called a vagus nerve stimulator with a wire to my brain. Nothing ever worked. Finally, uh, my partner at the time, she moved us to New York to get better medical care. Then I was in, then in Seattle. She knew I wasn't bipolar because her father was. And finally, I gave up hope. I attempted suicide with alcohol, uh, tequila, and pills. Spent four days in a the coma. Then seven weeks in a uh, psych ward in New York in Payne Whitney and where they ran every test conceivable to man most of which I had in Seattle already, and they got all my scans from Seattle and reports, and when they put everything together, they saw through brain scans progression of FTD as well as history and et cetera. So I sat in a room, and I'll never forget, they said, we believe you have uh, frontal temporal dementia. And I just said to them, does that come with extra wasabi and ginger? <laughs> And uh, it was, <laughs> and uh, I was happy. I was relieved because I was on this cycle, and now all of a sudden I was like, "So, what, is there a pill, a shot, a drink? What do I do?" Mm-hmm. And they're like, "No, it's unfortunately FTD is incurable, unstoppable, untreatable. Um, go home and die." Was pretty much what it was. Make your end of life plans. You probably have two, three years to live. That was four years ago. And wow. uh, I went home. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's a long story. I went home, and then my loved one at the time, who we're still very close to her, she just couldn't take any more, and left while I was in the hospital after the suicide attempt. And 
So now I wound up alone and being misdiagnosed all those years, you gotta realize your kids think you're crazy. They were young. My mm-hmm. uh you go broke. Medical, you know, cost of six years of being misdiagnosed, constant doctors, psychiatrists in that a hospital. And now all of a sudden you're told you can die and well you everyone think you have dementia, so your friends, your relatives, everybody treats you like a little child. You think you're crazy, and then you go look for support, and there is none, especially for uh-huh. rare disease. Wow. And, uh, I, so, yeah. I, I, and then that's one, just got to be so frustrating. Things, oh, yeah, one of the things, because of being misdiagnosed, I, I had a high-profile job. I used to fly 120 flights here. I also have long-term disability which I lost because I was misdiagnosed. And the uh, time, for even though it was proven I had this disease when I was working through all the doctor records, I was late on the paperwork. So I didn't get that, which meant I had to leave New York because I couldn't afford to stay there, which had my, I was diagnosed at Columbia in New York. I had the best doctors as well as, Friends, lifelong friends there, and I, now I'm in Arizona with pretty much nobody. <laughs> oh and, my goodness! Uh, my but goodness. life what, goes what, on. Yeah. What advice would you give others who are newly diagnosed um, with yes. FTD? Yes. Once you're newly diagnosed and you get over the shock of losing everything, and and literally you're losing yourself all the time, you can still have and deserve a life of happiness and purpose. You still can go on. It doesn't mean your life's totally over because you can't work your job and you're losing skills and acting strange. And there are things you could do. Um, I I also, I couldn't find support, so I started a support group on uh, Facebook, the secret private group. Many in the group don't participate in Facebook, just the group. And, some of the people in my group, they do speaking They you know, through different groups. One woman, she goes to the Alzheimer's Association, speaks with them, the Ford Foundation. Somebody else who I know, she's focused and did a documentary, Susan Grant. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's, it's out there. And another person, he helped in Canada, you know, with Native Americans, with Indians. And he's been received a national award from them. Uh, you, know, you have to keep going once you have it. Life isn't over, and mm-hmm. you just do the best you can for as long as you can. Uh, the group I started now has over 100 people in it from 20-plus countries. Wow, that's wonderful. What Can you tell us what your typical day looks like, Howard? Well, what it used to be and what's turned into now has changed. I used to blog a lot. Uh, I, everything with FTD, it's a type of dementia. It's routine, routine, routine. Um, I know hygiene and how everything. You could just not do anything. So I have the four S's. Uh, I'll just go bathroom, shower, shave, and Starbucks. I get my day started. I used to go to Starbucks every day and write or get online, do something every day. Um, I get headaches a lot now and my behavior is off. So I used to do this and try to accomplish something every day, no matter how little it is, and then not beat myself up for not being able to do everything. But now it's turned to really I'm isolating, which people with this disease have a tendency to do. My behavior around people is really inappropriate, and I get agitated and make sexual inappropriate comments to women and I just, I, I try, I really, my my driving isn't as good anymore, so I rarely leave the house. Okay. Well, that's got to be awful, awful tough. What, um, what is the worst part of the disease for you? The worst part of the disease? Well, you know, you know my kids now understand what it was that happened to me. So it's better. The worst part is I'm 57 and my life is over. It's gone pretty much. I I still do public speaking once in a while. If, you know, it's, I'm called on or 
do other things, but I really I don't do anything anymore. I I'm not good in public around people. I get agitated and angry really easily. Um, I get tired all of a sudden. I'm on zero meds now. It's just uh, where I used to have a wife take vacations, see my kids. Now I see them just two, three times a year when somebody helps with the plane tickets to send them to visit. And I just don't have a life. Mm-hmm. And I try doing blog when I can, but I haven't done that in a while. I am on the support group, which really turned into a lifeline because there's a lot of support out there for caregivers and other people with FD, but there's the people with the disease now. It's really not much for you once you get sick. And uh, there's really very, I, I would say if there's somebody out there listening who's newly diagnosed, call your local Alzheimer's Association try to find an early onset dementia group. I got that in New York and they paid for it, the Old Time Association. It was wonderful. And then AFTD did help. I I wouldn't be existing today if it wasn't for AFTD. Sharon, who was just on, is the uh, I drive her crazy probably five to seven days a week. She's the closest thing <laughs> to a caregiver I have. <laughs> uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, we're in contact all the time and I try to do my best. But People newly diagnosed should try to get into a support group, but different states here in Arizona, really, the Alzheimer's Association, it's just really, it's not effective. It doesn't really, you know, I, and not just for me, it, it doesn't do, say, where in New York, they really are active with people that maybe don't have Alzheimer's. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, okay. I got lost in the question. <laughs> nope. That's okay. What um, have you found any gifts in the disease? Anything that's in a kind of a backwards way come to you through this disease? Yeah. Um, well, my life has been a turmoil, but yes, um, I I just had a routine life. Businessman, successful, work very hard. Never been unemployed in my life. Uh, wonderful kids. Loved ones, spouse, you know, partners, and but now with this, um, like many others with the disease, if we get focused, we almost become fanatical on things. I put myself towards advocacy, and I, um, as you mentioned, uh, making a documentary. It's called Howard's Brain. Anybody could Google Howard's Brain and see a six-minute uh, clip on it that was done for Kickstarter a successful kickstart of a year or two ago. I, I'm working with somebody on a book who's writing a book about my experiences with FTD. I'm trying to get as much about awareness. I started two support groups, the one for patients, and I have one for caregivers called Ask the FTD Patients where caregivers join the group, the Facebook group, and they ask questions to get a perspective of those with FTD so they could better understand what their loved ones are going through because the majority are not like me. They're not aware that they're even sick. A lot of times I don't feel sick Sure. until we think about really what I'm doing. So I've done that. I've just focused my life on, you know, on awareness. And, yes, I know my kids are proud because, you know, my work is also, um, I guess, my blog and work. I got contacted by the um, the uh, Library of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and they're um, cataloging or whatever, uh, archiving all my work. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy to be have given back to society. I'm still giving back, and, uh, yeah, I'm happy I'm making – I get letters all the time from caregivers all over the world saying – because of what I've written and what I'm doing, they better understand what's going on. Many, if I could just say one other thing, many with FTD, it's dual fill. There are different variants. I have the behavioral, the most common, but there are also, mm-hmm. there's also primary PPA, primary progressive aphasia, where people lose the ability to speak, so you don't know what's going on with them, but we suffer the same a lot of the same, it's the same disease. So much of what's written, I guess, helps 
a lot of others understand what's going on with either behavior. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Um, now, you live alone, Howard. Is there any um, quick advice you would like to give people who are living alone with this disease? Um, because then I want to go ahead and pull Lisa in, who is caring for her husband, too, and kind of talk about that side. But is there is there any advice you'd like to give to someone living alone with FTD? Yes. Try to not isolate yourself so much. Try to get out to do things, try to get on an online support group. Uh, you could uh, just, I'm on Facebook, you could Howard Glick me there, or just Google Howard Glick and contact me if you want to join the group. But try to get something done, a little something done each day. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's the, you know, best advice I could do. Just try, you know, keep pushing, uh, you know, you FTD, once you have it, you have to live with it, and it just doesn't go anywhere. It's there. So I wrote to somebody last week, FTD, it's there. You know, it's here today, tomorrow. You you have no weekends, no vacations. It's always FTD till death do us part, but you can still uh-huh. have a life. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I so appreciate you uh, spending time with us today. Howard, and if you're able to hang on the line, I don't see any questions coming in yet, but we never know. People, I think, are probably just still gathering information. Um, If people have questions, again, you can call in to 714-364-4757. That's 714-364-4757. If you're listening via the chat box, you can always type in a question there, and I will be monitoring that as well. If you want to get a hold of Howard, you can um, look him up on Facebook. That's Howard Glick, and that's G-L-I-C-K. And he also has um, an early dementia support uh, uh, blogspot dot com. So um, that would be the best route to to go ahead and, and catch him. Again, thank you, Howard, for for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our thank you, Lord. our our next guest here, who is Lisa Griffin. And Lisa is a wife and a caregiver uh, to her husband John, who has uh, FTD. She has been married to John for 30 years, and John is only 57 years old, but he was diagnosed at the age of 49. And so this has been, a, um, I'm sure, a long and unexpected journey over the past eight years uh, for both Lisa and John and their family. Uh, they have two children. Matt is 24 and a graduate student of Creighton University, and Taylor, who's 21, who is an undergraduate at the U of M, and uh, here in the in the Twin Cities, and. Um, you know, her life, I, I'm just really anxious to hear about how how you survive this, Lisa, and, and how you make it work. So thank you for joining us today. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit about just how did you and John both um, come to even get a diagnosis of this disease? Um, Well, like um, Sharon explained to a lot of people, we did the standard, like she she talked to you, we were, you know, considered he had depression, considered he had bipolar disease, um, went through a lot of that, did a lot of tests, nobody could figure anything out. Um, He was a physician, so he kept saying, no, something is wrong. Um, And finally... um, just because he's starting to have so many of the symptoms that Sharon also talked about. I feel like it kind of went right down the line, as she explained, that Mm -hmm. um, we knew we really had to um, dig deeper, and then we went to the Mayo Clinic and were diagnosed over there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was kind of a process. I think, honestly, the process started for a couple years, um, it had to be at least probably three years before we really started to say, there, no, there is something wrong, and we need to figure this out a little bit more. So we were fortunate enough that we didn't have to do six years of treatment for bipolar or something like that, like Howard had to. 
Um, but I will say the unfortunate part is is our our home life was very difficult in those years because we didn't know what was going on. Neither one of us knew what was going on. Um, and it made it um, very stressful at home, stressful on myself, on John, and the kids. Um, so that, you know, that, that was probably a really, really tough part now when I look back. I didn't realize it at the time, but I'm thinking, wow, I almost think the tougher part of this disease is the, the, the period before when you're misdiagnosed or you're not diagnosed. Yeah. And um, nobody can tell you what's going on, but, you're, but there's something going on because it's just um, wrecking havoc on your lives. So Yeah, well, and you hear so many people say, you know, going through this process, they're thinking they're going to get divorced because they can't figure out, well, you know, where the behaviors are coming from or what is happening and the communication is starting to slip and just the frustration on everybody's side. I mean, just all that extra pressure um, has got to be very difficult. And then having kids at home getting, you know, uh, getting diagnosed um, so young, I, I just, I can't even imagine um, how difficult that period period was for you. How has your your view of people with dementia changed since it's knocked on your door? Um, well, my view has changed in that um, I think everyone needs to realize people with dementia are still people. Um, they're the same that they've always been, um, but dementia just does not allow them to convey the, the, the self that they are or the spirit that mm-hmm. we want recognized in them. And um, I really want people to know that and learn that and not isolate these people. Um, I have so many people that say, I don't know what, you know, oh, he won't know me or I don't know what to say to him or whatever. And I'm like, you don't have to do anything. Just go up there. They, he just wants to be around someone. And I think that's the mm-hmm. case with most patients. Um, yeah. They need love. They need, they need interaction. Mm-hmm. How would how would you like to see people um, with dementia be treated um, in in the future by the public, by the family, by professionals? Um, well, um, I want to see them treated as the person that they have always been, in a sense. Um, but just consider that it's a new version of them that you know. It wouldn't be any different if you saw someone and then the next time you saw them they had a leg amputated. You aren't going to treat them. Most people don't treat them that differently. Let's not do that. This is just a piece of them that's missing. It's a piece that we can't see, though. Um, Treat them as your brother or your mother or your father or your friend, whoever they were before. They maybe can't completely converse with you and um, satisfy your needs on that in the relationship, but... Um, on some level, I know they they get that and they need that. Um, so I just want them to be treated the same as you would want to be treated if you were in there. Okay. Well, and that's you know it's a it's a simple thing um, that we all say we want, and I think you know the only way we can really shift that is for all of us to become more conscious of how we care. And how we right. act, and how and how we react, and that's not something that we that we typically do. Um, how have you found kind of validation for your role as a care partner? Because that's not um, always an easy role to take take on. No, it's a it's a tough role. It's a lot uh, it's a lot tougher than I had anticipated. I really thought I was young and I could handle this, and I'm I'm pretty much of a goer. And I thought, well, no, I can do this. You know, I get it. Caregivers are talking about people that are 80 years old, that it's hard on them, but it's, it doesn't matter what age you are, it is hard on you. Um, mm-hmm. I think support from other caregivers, family, and friends is, is so essential. Um, I couldn't do it if I would not have had some of the family members and friends um, at my side. I just, I'm not sure I would, would have made it this far. Um, the one thing I will say, it's almost a relief to be able to talk with others who experience the same problems. Um, the kind of area of the country that I live in, of course, there's not a lot of people with FTD around here, but I have since connected with some people um, up in the Minneapolis area 
that um, has a support group and just talking to some of those ladies is it's just kind of like a sigh. It's just like, wow, okay, I'm not crazy. These same things are happening to me. The same things are happening to them. So it just gives you a validation that, you know, um, I- I'm making the right decisions because the wrong, the, you know, these questions are being put in front of me and I made this decision and was it right? And, and when you talk to everybody else who's done it or in the middle of it, I think we just all get a feeling of a little pat on the back that, okay, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. getting through it. It gives us a okay. peace of mind. Good, good. Well, I'm glad that you, you made those connections. What's, what would you like other care partners um, or caregivers to know? Is there any specific advice you'd like to give them? Well, like I had just said, mm-hmm. caregiving is a tougher job mm-hmm. than I had ever imagined. Um, you need to give yourself credit for doing one of, the, one of the toughest jobs there is. I think it's probably the toughest job I've ever had. Um, you need to take care of yourself, which I hate that statement because it is so hard to take care of yourself <laughs> when you have somebody else who needs way more care than you. But um, if you can do just a little bit, or hopefully you have a support system that can remind you to do that. Um, and um, if, you, um, if there's something someone can do to help you or you just um, just let them be caring and helpful to you. Um, a caregiver does not um, need to add more to their list. So I guess what I'm saying by that is if somebody comes up and says, oh, let me know what I can do for you, um, tell them, bring me dinner. I, I Learn to have the the nerve to say, please bring me dinner or please bring me this. I need that, which is uh-huh. extremely hard at, and I will admit I'm not good. But the one thing I want to say to those people is, you know what? I have so much on my mind. Please don't add another thing to my to-do list. Don't ask me to call you and tell you what I need. Just mm-hmm. just do something. Just do anything. Because any little thing lets us know that you're thinking about us, and it's it's always helpful. Wonderful. Well, I think that's that's excellent advice, Lisa, and I thank you so much for for spending time with us today. Um, if you're able to hang around, I'll be taking calls a little bit later. Um, somebody might have a question for you, but if if not, I totally understand. You've got a full plate there that you are <laughs> running with. <laughs> and so, again, thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. I'm going to go ahead and um, pull in our next guest, uh, which uh, we're lucky to have with us, Dr. Holmes and uh, Dr. Elvin Holmes uh, is with Bethesda Hospital here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and he's the founder and director of Cognitive and Behavioral Disorders Program at Bethesda Hospital. He's a graduate of the University of Iowa uh, College of Medicine, and he completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Minnesota, as well as a fellowship in geriatrics um, at the Veterans Administration Center here in Minneapolis under the direction of Dr. Gabe uh, Malata. Um, Dr. Holmes has had more than 20 years of experience in adult medicine and neuropsychiatry. Uh, um, his clinical practice is um, entirely devoted to the evaluation and treatment of cognitive and behavioral disorders later in life. Um, I personally know several people who uh, Dr. Holmes is a physician for, and uh, I have to tell you, Dr. Holmes, they just rave about you. So welcome to the show today. How are you? I'm very fine. Thank thank you. Well, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to have this conversation with us about FTD. It's just one of those diseases that not too many people know a lot about. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving us a a brief overview of um of maybe dementia as a whole for our audience, and um, and then we can kind of get into the diagnostic process of of trying to figure out uh, is FTD in somebody's life or not. You bet. Well, one of the things I like I would like the audience to understand is that the term dementia 
is what we might consider a rubric or categorical term. It represents a category of illness. It's no more appropriate to diagnose someone in this day and age with dementia than it is to diagnose them, let's say, with shortness of breath, meaning that there are many causes for shortness of breath, and the diagnostic evaluation is intended to identify which cause. We define dementia as an acquired disorder of intellectual and or behavioral impairment produced by a dysfunctional brain. And under this rubric, depending on how you count them, are more than 100 separate illnesses that result in the syndrome, if, it, uh, if you will, of acquired cognitive impairment or the syndrome of dementia. Now, one of the subcategories of dementing illness, of course, is frontotemporal dementia. And you're right, I, this is a, an illness that we uh, uh, can in, increasingly identify. But if we look at the prevalence of frontotemporal dementia in late life, uh, we realize that it is 200 times less prevalent than Alzheimer's disease. And this is an illness that breaks all the rules with respect to our understanding of dementia as informed by patients who suffer from Alzheimer's. So it is a challenge uh, not only to identify the illness but also to manage it because, again, so many things are different. The rules are very di different when it comes to managing in uh, a patient with FTD. Okay, wonderful. Can you tell people, let's say if somebody shows up, in your office, and they're having some some uh, problems. You know, how are you going to diagnose this? What what types of uh, tests uh, and things are they going to have to go through? Sure. Well, um, again, it, it's important to realize that when we endeavor to diagnose any dementing illness, generally what we're rendering is a clinical diagnosis. And what that means is that the doctor or care provider takes a, a history from the patient and preferably also from an informant, someone who knows this person very well. They then uh, engage in an exam, and the exam should include a medical evaluation, a focused neurological evaluation, and a mental status exam that should touch on aspects of cognitive performance as well as mood and behavior. Uh, Generally, then, one does some selected diagnostic testing um, that, um, that would include uh, blood work, uh, oftentimes a structural image of the brain, uh, an MRI uh, preferably, and then sometimes formal thinking testing called neuropsychological te testing. Once all of this has been gathered, uh, the care provider looks at all of this information to determine whether uh, a patient can fit into one of the clinical or one of the sets of clinical criteria that are used to diagnose uh, one of the uh, FTD subsyndromes. Okay, now one thing that's important to realize is that a clinical diagnosis I is attained because we don't have one diagnostic test. Okay, to diagnose uh, many of these il illnesses. And, and so we have to look at the data. We have to make a judgment. And very commonly, as these illnesses emerge clinically, it can be somewhat uncertain as to what someone has. So there is a degree of uncertainty that exists with a clinical diagnosis of dementing illness, particularly, again, uh, in the early stages of the illness as it begins to emerge uh, cl clinically. Uh, and as we follow patients uh, in time, sometimes we change our, our impression as to what they might have. Uh, you know, the science is, is, is advancing very rapidly in this area, but uh, still, uh, a clinical diagnosis generally would indicate some degree of clinical uncertainty, and sometimes uh, that impression changes as the illness uh, becomes more clinically manifest. Okay. Now, how how do you recommend or how do you, um, in, in your clinic, um, support patients and, and families dealing with this disease? Well, it, I, I think that, that research in this area is very clear. I, certainly from the standpoint of caregivers, they typically want three things. First is an accurate diagnosis. They want to know 
what it is they're uh, faced with. And it's not uncommon that a patient may come to our clinic, and I would imagine any clinic that deals with these problems, and this has been a years-long journey to try and figure out what is wrong with my loved one. So an accurate diagnosis is very important. Ongoing management from a care provider or team that has uh, some understanding and, and experience in dealing with this illness, and ongoing support and ed- education is also very, very important. Uh, these are things, um, you know, I like to tell families that knowledge is king here. The more we know about the illness your loved one has, the more empowered we can be in terms of making appropriate choices, the more comfortable we can be with respect to treatments, uh, the more prepared we can be for what's coming. So those are the important things, I believe. Okay, great. When you when you see families come into your office, um, what can what kind of average state are they in? Um, I, I would imagine that they've got to be, you know, when they're starting this process, somewhat in crisis and just at their wits end. From from what I'm hearing from everybody, um, and how frustrating um, this this disease can be to get diagnosed and, and pinpoint. Well, I think so. I I think we see a spectrum, and I Mm -hmm. would say that there's a lot of apprehension uh, and fear. Uh, Again, understanding frontotemporal dementia is a great challenge, particularly the the behavioral variant form. Uh, Certainly, there have been though, or there are those that would come that have had maybe a relatively short experience with the clinical signs of the illness. There are others, as I mentioned, who come in after years of uh, of being evaluated and dealing with crises and not really knowing what it is that their loved one has. Um, so there's a whole gamut, but but I think that uh, that in all instances, uh, general support of not only the patient but the family is uh, remarkably important and something that has to be incorporated into clinical management uh, of these patients, both in in, uh, in in primary care settings as well as specialty care settings as we might have here. Okay. Um, can you share with us um, any any stories, just kind of generic stories of kind of uh, maybe a, a typical family um, in their journey and, and how the process has, has gone for them? <laughs> Well, I will tell you that I, I think it is a relief once we can make a fairly firm diagnosis of the illness, that we finally know what it is we're dealing with. Um, I think that uh, the journey is uh, uh, has a lot of ups and downs, as I think any caregiver would tell you, and I think as, as patients sometimes can tell you. One of the things that we know today about neurodegenerative illnesses is that they do seem to spread through the brain. Um, uh, And as these illnesses spread, the clinical manifestations of the illness can change. So as an example, in frontotemporal dementia, uh, one can begin the journey with the emergence of maybe a movement disorder that might look a little bit like Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, Then over time, we start seeing changes in language function which can be very frustrating, and then yet again it can change into what appears to be more of a behavioral variant form. So there are many, many things that one uh, sees in an illness like this over a relatively short period of time, and each of these uh, generates challenges, yes. Okay. I I can imagine. Now, have um, one of the questions I usually ask, people and I haven't been asking so far, but I'll ask you, have you been personally touched by this disease with family or friends at all, or or what made you decide to kind of um, get interest in in this disease? Well, that's, yeah, I have not had a family member who's had it, but I've been touched, believe you me. (laughs) Uh, Anyone who deals with this illness, I can't help but being touched. Um, Well, let me tell you about my journey. I um, uh, did uh, complete training in internal medicine. I always had a a penchant for, uh, for psychiatry and in the in the late 1980s, there was a a specialty program at the 
VA hospital here that specialized in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, after I finished my internal medicine training, I did a fellowship there. It was boarded in geriatric medicine, but it was really more of, of a what we might call neuropsychiatry program. Uh, I fell in love with the field. Of course, in those days, we thought that 90% or 95% of patients suffering from dementing illness had Alzheimer's disease. But obviously, over the last 25 years, with the advent of, of new techniques to examine the brain and, and the wonderful uh, 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 research uh, coming out of a number of areas in, in England and Sweden, we became aware of of, uh, of this illness that we now refer to as frontotemporal dementia. Here, uh, where I work, uh, I've been involved in a, a treatment program for, it'll be beginning its 23rd year now, that really is dedicated to the diagnosis and effective management of adults who have acquired cognitive impairment. So it, it goes without saying that as the field has advanced, uh, we've uh, developed increasing interest in uh, the neurodegenerative diseases that we can more readily identify. and. And, uh, and, and the field of frontotemporal dementia has been a remarkable journey. Uh, the, the, uh, the increase in knowledge base of this illness has just been phenomenal over the last 10, 15 years or so. Uh, and, uh, and not only in, in frontotemporal, but, uh, but just in the, in the field of neuro, neurodegenerative illnesses, I think that, that the research in, in FTD has gone a long way to inform us as to what neurodegeneration actually is, uh, uh, regardless of the type, and how these illnesses establish themselves in the brain and how they spread. And, and so, um, so, yes, uh, as our program has evolved, uh, we have uh, been able to identify and, and serve the needs of patients with uh, with uh, with FTD. Okay. Um, now, with your clinic, um, do you can people come from out of state to your clinic, or um, are, are you just specifically Minneapolis based, uh, St. Paul, or I should say St. Paul based? Well, no, no, no. We we certainly would welcome anyone, um, and and we do have we we do have an inpatient treatment program as well. Uh, our inpatient treatment program is dedicated to the effective evaluation and management of the behavioral disturbances that occur in these patients, as well as uh, managing their medical problems. You know, uh, neurodegenerative brain disease is not an illness that exists uh, isolated from uh, the rest of the body. Many of these patients have complex medical problems that need to be managed, and they need to be managed in a thoughtful way that considers their brain illness. Uh, so, so we have um, an inpatient treatment program uh, here. Uh, again, we'll be starting our 23rd year uh, in a few months, and, and we've served over 10,000 patients in that unit uh, that have uh, uh, various forms of dementing illness and severe behavior behavioral problems related to those illnesses. But, uh, no, certainly we, we see patients probably mostly from the Minnesota and Wisconsin area, but we've certainly uh, seen them from, uh, uh, from farther uh, range as well. Okay, wonderful. If people want, <clears throat> want to get in touch with you, um, is the best number just for them to go ahead and, and call the office and, um, and make an appointment? Oh sure, yeah, and and I think you probably have that available on your website. Yep, and that number again yeah. is six five one three two six twenty one fifty. That's six five one three two six twenty one fifty. Um, if you're interested in uh, talking with uh, with Dr. Holmes and learning more about his clinic, well, I thank you so much for your. Your time today. Was there anything else that you wanted to share with our audience? I know you're on a tight schedule, and I want to appreciate well, that. Well, no, I, I have a few more minutes. I, I did want to talk a little bit about treatment. I think um, okay. that uh, this would be uh, worth spending a few minutes if we have the time. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, the um, I think uh, the when it when it comes to neurodegenerative brain disease, I think a lot of the focus is on the cure or what we might refer to as 
d disease modifying therapies. Uh, but the reality is that the management of a brain illness is much more than that. And I like to remind patients and families or inform them that we really, when we talk about treatment, we're talking about intervening in three broad domains of in intervention. The first might be what we would refer to as disease modifying therapies. The second is wellness. And the third is environmental support. With respect to disease-modifying therapies, it's important to realize that at this point in time, we do not have a cure or disease-modifying therapies for frontotemporal dementia. However, uh, this field is, 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 is uh, accelerating at a remarkable pace. And again, the, the acquiring of new knowledge in this area is just uh, hard to de describe. I mean, it's just uh, uh, it's increasing at a rapid pace. I might compare, or might contrast my experience with Alzheimer's disease with that of FTD. And in spite of all the remarkable things that we're seeing in Alzheimer's, we are seeing a lot of things. 25 years ago, when I was a fellow in training, there were those involved in research that believed that we were five years away from a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And that was in 1988. And here we are in 2015, and again, there's a lot of good work going on, and we hope to be hearing something very soon. But I think the reality is that Alzheimer's disease turned out to be a much more complicated illness than anyone really thought. Now, if we contrast uh, that experience with, with what we have with FTD, the, the amount of research coming out uh, from, the, from the FTD research centers is just uh, remarkable. And again, it is informing us with respect to to what neurodegeneration really is in the brain. And there are those who believe, and I would tend to feel the same way, that, that frontotemporal dementia may be the first neurodegenerative brain disease for which there is uh, illness-modifying therapies, and they may be coming very, very soon. Uh, but what's even more exciting, I believe, is that, again, because FDD has informed us so much as to what neurodegeneration really is, it's possible, I think, that when we have disease-modifying therapies for FTD, uh, these therapies might be applicable to other neurodegenerative Ill illnesses. That is, there's a lot of commonality between the very common Ill illnesses that we treat. So more to come. But in terms of re research, there's a lot of work going on in areas such as improving uh, the the amount of growth factors within brain cells. There are immunization uh, uh, studies going on to, to attempt to prevent the spread of these pathological proteins throughout the brain and, in fact, halt the illness. Um, there are what are referred to as loss of function studies, uh, medicines that are being trialed in Alzheimer's as well as in FTD to restore function to brain cells that have been rendered dysfunctional because of these uh, changes. There's also gene therapy as well, and 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 there are um, there are, are very in interesting trials with respect to treatments for the behavioral manifestations of the illness. So that's the one area, uh, um, illness-modifying therapies. Let's talk a little bit about wellness. Nobody thinks well. Nobody functions well if they have an illness. And if you have a neurodegenerative brain disease and you're also sick, you're not going to do well. So what we want to do as part of a treatment program for anybody with a chronic brain disease is to make sure that we maintain wellness. And what that means is that we treat uh, chronic medical problems in an ongoing and thoughtful way. And what I mean by thoughtful is a way that considers the dementing illness that the patient has. We also want to identify and treat effectively emerging medical problems. And here, very commonly, what we're talking about are neuropsychiatric or behavioral complications of, of these illnesses. We also want to promote good diet. We want to promote patients being active. We want them to have a routine in their day. A lot of things that we would wrap into a wellness program for any of us are so important when patients suffer from chronic illness, and I would submit when they're suffering from a chronic illness of the brain, it's even more important. So very fundamental aspects of wellness have to be incorporated into a treatment program. 
The third domain we like to talk about is that of environmental support. There are environments where patients with frontotemporal dementia can function very, very well, and there are environments that are very destructive. Okay? So we talk about environmental support as being key and fundamental in the management of this illness. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about a constant physical environment, a constant uh, routine, and particularly for the behavioral variant form of the illness, a, an environment that can, uh, can manage the lack of, of a patient's ability to respond appropriately to the social and emotional cues that most of us find very important uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and these are the things, of course, that are so uh, anxiety-evoking to families. You know, in the 23 years that I've done this work uh, here in St. Paul, um, one thing rings very true, uh, and we learned this many, many years ago, and it, it, it remains true today. The number one reason for the inappropriate overuse of psychiatric medications in the management of behavioral problems in neurodegenerative brain disease, the number one reason is that patients are living in environments that are too challenging for them. And when these environments are too challenging, very commonly the manifestation of that challenge is in a neuropsychiatric problem, confusion, uh, agitated behaviors, insomnia. And very commonly, when we don't consider the environment, what ends up happening is that we start treating these problems with medicines. Okay, pharmacological band-aids, I like to call them, trying to manage what we're not managing with environmental control. I liken a controlled environment to a patient, let's say with frontotemporal dementia, to a prosthetic limb, to an amputee. If you have someone who's lost a leg and they can be fed with a prosthetic and they can learn how to use it, if they're wearing pants and walking, you would never know that they lost their leg. You take that leg away and they can't ambulate at all. Environmental support in neurodegenerative brain disease is much like that. And given good environmental support, patients can do remarkably well. In fact, in the early stages of illness with uh, an appropriate environment, it can be very hard uh, to be able to tell that a patient has a problem. But if they get into a very challenging environment, then uh, we all can see the problem. So these are uh, very fundamental. Environmental support and wellness is fundamental. Uh, research will provide us with, uh, with illness-modifying therapies that I think will be wonderful. But these therapies will not not uh, bridge the gap. We have to incorporate uh, very fundamental aspects of wellness and environmental support in the management of patients. When we do that, we can have great success in terms of managing them. Well, that's, that is fantastic. Uh, again, Dr. Holmes, I so appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us today and give us such valuable information. Um, again, if people want to um, Talk to Dr. Holmes at Bethesda Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. You can call 651-326-2150. Again, that's 651-326-2150. Thank you again for being with us, and have a great day, Dr. Holmes. You bet. Thank you. Before I um, pull in our next guest here, I am just going to go over some mid-program highlights. Um, our last radio show, we had Carrie Mills on, who is the founder and president of Engaging Alzheimer's. And Carrie is also the author of a, a co-author of the book called I Care, a Handbook for Care Partners and People with Dementia, which is a, a, an excellent book. Our next show, we're going to be talking about dementia-friendly initiatives, and Memory Matters is going to be on, which is a community-based nonprofit organization um, that strives for excellence um, in person-centered care for those with Alzheimer's and other, other forms of dementia. And uh, then later this afternoon, if you have not joined us before, or even if you have, we'd love to have you join us again for Dementia Chats. So we'll be starting at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. That's 2 Central Time, 1 o'clock Mountain, and noon Pacific Time. And if you're over in London, that would be 8 p.m. Those are free webinars where our experts are those with dementia. And we don't really have any agenda. Uh, we just kind of let the community and our experts take us where we need to go. So you can just go to alzheimerspeaks.com 
and go to our About page to Dementia Chats, and you'll find the link there. You can go to our Facebook page as well, or even on the, the home page of our of our main site. Um, <clears throat> on our blog, we've got several things I want to highlight that you might be interested in. Um, Michael Ellenbogen did a, a video called Dear President, and it's really addressed to the President and Congress and, you know, I just tagged on, are you listening um, about the needs? And I think he did a nice job. There is also a video called The Alzheimer's Love Story, The First Day of the Rest of My Life, that was provided to us from Silverado. And then there's a great video on considering when to decide to stop driving, which is done uh, by a woman by the name of Truthful Kindness who has dementia. And she talks about uh, what she uh, thought about in order to make that decision. Uh, also, the Purple Angel Project, um, which is the global symbol for dementia, is got a Kickstarter program, and they would like to do a documentary on how this uh, this program has just filtered around the world using social media and the impacts it's had. Mike Good also submitted an article on wandering, and uh, that's a that's a really really good uh, good article as well. And he is uh, the founder of Together in This. Uh, before I go to our our final um, guest, it looks like we might have a couple of questions on the line. So let me just check here. I have somebody. Um, that has been on the line here for a while with us. Let me see. From a 509 number, 509, you are on the line, on the um, air live. Did you have a question or a comment? Hi, this is Amy. Am I on? Hi, Amy. How you doing? Did you have a question or a comment for us? Yes, please. Uh, uh, my name is Amy Shives. I am a person who has been diagnosed with FTD as well as um, uh, Alzheimer's uh, mixed. So I I vacillate between uh, diagnoses. I'd like to thank you all today for a wonderful show, every one of you, uh, wonderful contributions and a wonderful balance of information. Um, I'm currently uh, an early stage advisor to the National Alzheimer's Association, so I've got my my hands in this uh, pretty thickly, and I am a patient at University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Clinic, where I'm in many clinical studies, and I attend down there yearly. But my reason to call today is very specific, to thank Howard Glick for everything he has done for the advocacy of us with the disease. He is absolutely a lifeline for us. He is a wealth of information to refer to. Um, He is kind. Uh, He is consistently there for the people with the disease. So I just wanted to say shout out about Howard and uh, just tell him very publicly, and I hope he's still there, how much we all appreciate him. Thank you. Oh, that is wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to call in. Really appreciate that, Amy, very much. We also have a caller on the line from a 951 number. 951, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, good morning, Lori. This is Rich from California. Oh, hi, Rich. How are you I, doing? I'm doing well. I enjoyed Dr. Holmes. Had a lot of interesting things to say. As you know, I dealt with um, early onset Alzheimer's and my wife, she passed away at 59. And um, one of the points he was making was um, how the doctors are getting better at diagnosing this. At least they have improved over the last 10 years. My question is, do you think that if more awareness was out there about the disease, the the patients or future patients could actually find their way to a doctor? Because a lot of times some of the symptoms are so overlooked because we just don't understand that something's going on. Yeah, that is that is very, very true. Um, you know, I think the more awareness there is, the easier it will be for people to be able to, to, to find where to go. I, I still think we have a long ways to go. Um, you know, for people to have to wait, you know, two to four years to, to get a firm diagnosis, it, it's just not acceptable. Um, and granted, it's better than what it was. Um, 
and you know having these conversations will help people even decide to go to the doctor um, to have the conversation to at least start it but uh, again I, I think we're a, a ways away from from the goal line but we're, we're creeping closer we are definitely uh, creeping closer and I think the more we can all push it push this information out uh, the easier we will make everybody's life in the long run I know, there. I know you're pressed to get your next guest on but I'm just hoping somehow we find a key to get the awareness out there. I'm, as you know, I'm doing what I can through social media, and I just think that's the answer is getting the awareness out there somehow. I agree. I definitely agree. Well, thank you so much for calling in today, Rich, and um, cheers for all you're doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our our next guest. Uh, we have Heidi Lemaire on, who is the wellness director with Prelude. Um, and Prelude is located here in Minnesota. Heidi is charged with the on-site leadership and direction of the Prelude family and residents of Prelude Cottages, um, here in Woodbury, Minnesota. She is exceptionally gifted and respected, and her experience is really in the field of memory care. She has 13 years of experience as a director of housing and community services, and she is particularly strong in the area of training. Um, and she has created and delivered a curriculum in the field of memory loss and end of life care. Um, so welcome. How are you doing today, Heidi? I'm doing good, Lori. Thank you. Well, that's good. I am going to go ahead and introduce Judy Berry as well uh, so that we can have both of you on at the same time. Judy Berry is the founder of Dementia Specialist Consulting and the Lakeview Ranch model of specialized dementia care. Uh, Judy is nationally recognized for her innovations and her successes in providing specialized dementia care for people with dementia and a history of challenging and aggressive behavior. She uh, coaches professionally, um, both families and professionals, and she is, uh, you know, teaches people how to communicate um, and validate feelings and meet emotional and spiritual needs um, in addition to the physical needs for seniors with dementia, or I should say people with dementia. Um, she has provided inspiration and um, has just done a lot of, of cool, innovative work in her time. In fact, in 2010, uh, Judy won the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Community Health Leaders Award, which is honored to in individuals who have overcome daunting odds to improve the health and quality of life in marginalized communities. And then in 2011, she was named the Encore Careers uh, Purpose Prize Fellow in recognition for her success as a social entrepreneur over the age of 60. So welcome, Judy. Oh, hi. I thought you were talking to Heidi. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pull you two kind of both in at the, at the same time, Judy, since okay. you are up. That's fine. Since since you're consulting um, with Prelude. So, um, Heidi, I'm right. going to uh, throw this first question to you. And um, can you tell us, you know, why Prelude Memory Care is interested in, um, you know, FTD and the population at, at large? Yeah, I, I can. Um, you know, Prelude... Perilude has been um, serving memory loss patients now for about four years in a cottage setting. Um, the vast majority of the residents that we're serving are are quite elderly, most with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or a related uh, type dementia. And what we've noticed, and uh, you know, obviously since I've been here with Prelude and really throughout my career, what it, what what I've noticed and what we've noticed is that um, the population that most memory care facilities are serving doesn't really um, suit the younger onset population of individuals. Um, and as we know from the call today, a lot of those individuals that are younger are suffering from some sort of an impairment in the frontal lobe of the brain. 
Uh, it just kind of happens that way. Obviously, there are some younger um, onset with, you know, with the with Alzheimer's disease, obviously. But there's a there's a whole different population out there that um, is needing services, needing placement. Maybe family caregivers are um, tapped out or zone, you know, in a zone where they're not able to provide the care any longer, and the individuals just aren't seeming to fit into that that group, that setting very well for a number of reasons, including um, hearing even hearing Howard talk about his uh, difficulties with the unpleasant symptoms that the disease brings along. It just doesn't sit well. So we just started thinking as a group that perhaps there was a better way. Uh, perhaps there was an environment that would support uh, these individuals, and it wouldn't be so much like fitting the round, um, you know, peg into the square hole uh, kind of thing, or vice versa. Um, so that's how we got to talking about uh, FTD population and how, uh, why we are interested in getting into that is really to serve a population that we, we feel is underserved or served in a way that doesn't do justice to their well-being. Okay. Now, you um, are, are starting... A- you know, a new kind of venture with Prelude, um, the Garden Estate Home, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to be opening in March. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can, yes. We Our Garden Estate Home is opening in the beginning of March, and this is a home that is actual residential setting. It's, a, it's an estate home, if you will, so a very large um, family type home versus a, a, a facility image in your mind. This is built like a, a, a like your mind's house would be built. So it's just a large home. It has six rooms, um, and then obviously common living spaces, family room, dining room, you know, sunroom, different things like that. And um, we have six rooms that we're going to be offering in that house. And we have decided uh, with this population that we will be serving male residents in this house after talking with the community, um, talking with specialists in the area. We felt that we didn't want to do co-ed um, on this one and that we would go with an all-male home for this first um, first attempt that we're doing here with the Garden Estate. Okay. Wonderful. Um, our, our goal, yes. Mm-hmm. Go, go ahead. ahead. I just was going to say our goal with that is to really have a place that uh, supports supports the needs that they have day to day to get um, through their activities of daily living to be successful in their day, but to also not stand out um, as different within the rest of the population. So we're really looking forward to that. And we would, of course, serve folks that have a, a type any type of FTD, but also if they had younger onset uh, dementia of any kind. So it's not. Uh, restricted to FTD population. However, we feel that that's going to be our client in that build in that building. Okay, great. What what differences do you see? Um, do you expect to see? I guess in caring for this population in the in the Garden Estates home. Well, it you know because it is a younger uh, population that we're looking at. There's a lot of things that are that are going to be different just in that respect, and then just in the disease process itself. We've done some research and found that with an FTD diagnosis, sometimes memory loss is not the leading symptom, which was kind of an aha for our group. And so, what we know to work in a traditional memory care. Uh, might not work as well in this setting. And so we expect to see some of those dynamics. Um, we expect to see families that are much younger. We accept, expect to see some of these folks have children that are still young or maybe teenage or very young adult. Um, you know, we expect that spouses, young spouses, are going to be bringing their husbands to us. Um, and so there's a whole different dynamic um, that we see coming. In fact, we have trained all of our onboarding staff uh, just this morning, actually. They watched the video from the AFTD, It Is What It Is, and um, getting our, our staff and caregivers' minds around the client and the family that we're going to be serving and how that's going to be different than what they're used to seeing in a traditional memory care setting. 
Okay. Now you're also doing some consulting with with Judy. Um, can you tell us what yes. you know what you're looking at uh, her bringing into to Prelude to help you? Yeah, we're really excited to be partnering with Judy on on this for all of the reasons that she mentioned um, in her bio. Uh, just her her experience and her method with the Lakeview Ranch and how she has been able to just identify that niche and that um, we're really excited to learn from her on how to um, really give a lot of choice for these individual residents and make them be more in control of their life. She's talked a lot about how saying yes more often is so much more important than saying no, you can't. And so we're just really looking forward at forward to her uh, her techniques in that and actually our training with our group starts just this afternoon here so we're really I would defer to her a little bit more about what she's going to talk to us about but we're thrilled uh, she has such a wonderful reputation in our community and we're just so uh, honored really to be having her time and attention wonderful well Judy can you can you give us a little idea of of what your goals are in terms of working with Prelude, what what do you think you can bring to the table when it comes to dealing with FTD? Well, what I would really, I am also honored that they asked me to come and be a part of their um, startup and their ongoing training. Um, when I had 15 years experience developing a model of care at Lakeview Ranch, it was specifically for the population of people who had repeated behavioral hospitalizations and were being moved from place to place because no, none of the, um, most of the memory cares were not actually set up to deal with the behavioral piece. And with FTD, that appears to be some of the initial signs that, um, you know, and we have had residents with FTD. So my hope is that I can bring the knowledge that I gained over those 15 years uh, here to train people at Prelude to be able to um, create an environment that's the very best it can be for the residents who are there. And also to have the whole program include families in um because family is a huge part of what's going on with someone with dementia, and you do need to address both. Mm-hmm. Can you give us a, a couple of our audience a couple of tips in terms of, well, you know, when you're dealing with someone who might be having some um, behavioral issues, uh, you know, such as reactions to the, this disease, and how how to approach or divert or what would you recommend? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest things I learned throughout this 15 years is that um, all behavior is um, coming from an emotional need, not necessarily a physical need. And most places are focused on physical needs and keeping people um, busy or distracted if they're having a, um issue with emotion. And what I saw was that people weren't validating that emotion. And so when at the ranch, when we did that, we were able to eliminate 93% of all behavior, even though it didn't matter what the, whether it was Alzheimer's or FTD or other types of dementia. So what I'm hoping to bring here is to be able to get help their staff, help their families, help all of us understand how dementia progresses and how to honor that person as a whole human being and show how to communicate with them. Um, you know, all most people with dementia towards the later stages, they lose their ability to communicate. And that's something that doesn't mean that that person's gone anywhere. It doesn't mean that they've changed from who they were. It means that they are no longer able to communicate with you 
um, in the manner that we expect. And often our perceptions and our expectations of what makes someone human are affected by how their behavior changes. And I need to be able to share with the people here at Prelude, um, you know, that fact that that person is always there till the day they die and that they're not changing, they're not fading away. And when you are able to try to address the emotional need behind the behavior instead of just trying to distract them, that is when you're able to prevent the behavior. It's all about prevention. Judy, can you give us like an example of what you mean by, you know, getting to that that emotional trigger? How would how would you handle that? Can you can you give us a an um an example? I think it might be easier for the audience to understand. Well, it, you know, when you um when you are seeing someone who is visibly maybe getting upset, for instance, and they're crying, and Mm -hmm. you as a caregiver, whether it's family or, um, you know, whether it's professional staff, are going up to that person and trying to distract them in to do something else. So you think that you're helping by doing that, but in the meantime, you skip the step that is validating what you're seeing in that person, the emotion. You know, someone's crying. Say, for instance, you're crying, Lori, and Mm -hmm. I walk up to you and say, oh, come on, let's go over here and bake cookies. You know, what does that make you feel like? I've just dishonored all of your emotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm wondering what your reaction to that would be. Yeah, I would like, don't you care? Don't you notice? Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you, you go through all of, all of that kind of stuff, you know. I don't want to bake cookies, you know. I, I need to deal with something else right now. Well, and nobody wants to stop and take the time to do that. Not nobody, mm-hmm. but, I mean, most people. And most times it's because they don't have staff, enough staff, I should say. And... The other missing piece is that staff do not have that type of training, training on how to discover and meet emotional needs. Well, And, and you I have think it, to be able to know about that person and who they are as a human being and realize and I, that they're never changing. And I don't think that we do that well as a society as a whole. You know, there's a lot of people that see emotion and, you know, divert, divert, you know. Running yeah. in, another, in another direction. And well, that's so, what I found too is that they run away from it rather than step into it with them and yep. validate that feeling. Okay, okay. So that's very much too what like uh, Naomi uh, File talks about in her validation programs is is you know be with them. You know that we got to stop changing yeah. them all the time. And so um, you know I think that. Is a uh, well, and good it's example. about our perceptions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think that that will be um, absolutely fantastic for the the staff um, over at Prelude and, and for the families uh, to to learn some of these techniques and have a deeper deeper understanding. Um, Heidi, I'm going to throw another question to you. Um, have you been facing any any challenges with um, trying to focus on be, on the behaviors at all, um, and and doing kind of a you know, you know, it's kind of a, a cutting edge. There's not, I mean, that's one of the biggest things people will talk about. There's no place, you know, that I can go, you know, with my with my loved one um, who is having challenging times. So have you gotten any pushback or has this really been a, um, an exciting time when you're talking to people about uh, developing this program? Heidi, are you there? 
I am. I forgot to put my mute button back on again. I'm so <laughs> okay. sorry. Um, Lori, we 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 are really in an exciting time. Um, we do obviously. There's always challenges when you're building a new building, um, getting it ready, ensuring that you know you're going to be ready when the residents are ready to come. All of those types of things have been challenging. Um, focusing in and learning, um, you know, really being careful and thoughtful about our client process and selection um, to ensure that we're serving who we've set out to serve. Those have probably been the challenges, um, but really who I've spoke with, uh, the family members that I've spoke with uh, regarding what we're trying to do here. Everyone's very excited about it. Everyone um, it has had a positive reaction to it. Uh, even talking in the industry with individuals I've met over the years, they, you know, wow, we we need that. There is no place. You know, everyone sees uh, individuals um, going in and out of Jerry Jerry psychiatric wards or um, being discharged repeatedly. You know, from the, from other living environments, and they're they're coming to us on the phone or coming to our door saying. I want out of this cycle. Can what do you have? Can can this work? Will this work? How can I help you make this work? And so we've just really been blessed, really we believe by by God um, in this project and be able to uh, pull it together. And 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 the challenges are, are becoming far less than I think what the um, the good positive outcomes might be from this type of setting and environment and. You're right. It's the only one, at least in the metro uh, Twin mm-hmm. Cities area, that we know of that's that's doing this. So, yeah. Well, that is uh, it's fabulous, and I applaud you guys for for going down this path because it's definitely a need. And um, I wish you, you know, the utmost success um, in your journey, you know, um, with this. So I'm gonna. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I'll be here for your for your opening in March because I'm going to be traveling quite a bit. <laughs> but I'll, I'll definitely want to get out there and and take a peek at things. Yes. Um, Judy, I have a question I want to pose to you. Um, we've only got a, f- a few minutes left here, but um, why do you think it's so critical um, for our residential care homes to start focusing on um, FTD? I do believe that um, from an early onset standpoint, FTD is overtaking Alzheimer's. Now, I'm just going by facts and figures that are online. Um, You know, normally um, early onset Alzheimer's has not had a whole lot of support. There's more support for things that go on. And FTD is becoming way more diagnosed and the doctors are getting better at um, identifying the parts of the brain that are being affected, you know, with the frontal lobe and things like that. And the frontal lobe controls people's inhibitions. So often Mm -hmm. with the earlier stage people with FTD, they don't always have memory loss. So people don't attribute it to dementia or to a brain disease. And it's really difficult, much more difficult for families to deal with and even understand because here's this person they love, maybe still even working, and all of a sudden they're coming out and doing very um, inappropriate things. And, you know, nobody kind of sees it for what it is. And I do think that it's, about, you know, it's time that we... And I applaud um, Phil and Heidi and everybody here at Prelude that is um, deciding to take on that challenge because it is more and more frequent. And um, like Dr. Holmes said, they're getting much better at being able to diagnose it at an earlier stage. Yeah, definitely. Well, I thank you both for... um, taking time to be on the show with us if you are interested in uh, prelude you prelude uh, memory care you can go to www.preludecares that's with an s at the end dot com or you can call them directly at 651-354-6935 again that's 651 
354-6935. And for Judy Berry, you can contact her through her website at dementia specialist consulting.com again that's dementia specialist consulting.com or you can call her at 320-267-1384 that's 320-267-1384 and um, again I just want to thank you ladies for for being part of our program today you're welcome. Thanks You're welcome. for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I also want to just give out again uh, the contact information for the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, or AFTD, and their website is www.theaftd.org. You can also call their hotline or helpline at 866 866- Five zero seven seven two seven seven. That's eight six six five zero seven seven two two two. And Howard Glick again. You can reach him through Facebook. Uh, again, that's Howard and Glick is G L I C K. He'd be more than glad to talk with you. Doctor Holmes with Bethesda Hospital can be reached at six five one three two six. Two one five zero. That's six five one three two six twenty one fifty. And again, from all of us here at Alzheimer's Speaks, um, thank you so much for joining the show. And I would really appreciate it if you share this episode with your Facebook friends, with your LinkedIn groups, with your Google circles, or if you have an email list, you can actually um, download the episode and share it as well. It's just critical we work together to help people get the information that they need. And I hope that you'll be able to join us for Dementia Chats this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. 2 Central, 1 Mountain Time, and Noon Pacific Time. And over in London, that will be 8 o'clock. That is a platform, again, that is a free webinar that you can ask people living with dementia uh, questions, um, make comments. We get great insights, no formal agenda. And, again, that is another thing that can be shared. Just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and you'll have all the information there. Have a blessed week, everyone. Talk to you next week. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.